Good morning. It was reported yesterday that Peter Lee, who is the immediate past um, Bishop of Virginia, um, died. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, people, I know people here know Peter Lee. Um, there's a reason I've said that, though. Um, so it was reported. And so there's um, a lot, as you can now, as things happen, right, there are all these um, people are writing on social media about their experience of Peter Lee. He's a longtime Bishop of Virginia, elected when he was quite young and lived through um, and was bishop through some of the most divisive times in our church, in our recent memory. And the image that keeps popping up on social media is actually extremely touching. This was on Saturday that this news had come out. We have decided to do this service quite a while ago um, and use Paul A. Murray as kind of a, a, a lens through which to think about what it means to be an American in this time. The image that is being shared is of Peter Lee with his crossed um, stole, which is a very old-fashioned way to wear your stole in front of your bishop, right? Um, you rarely see it these days. Full head of hair, right? Very 70s kind of haircut. In 1977, January of 77, young and handsome, leading Polly Murray into the Chapel of the Cross for her first Eucharist at the altar at which her great-grandmother had been baptized an enslaved person. In our own lifetime, Right? In our, within the scope of our own lifetimes, what has changed? And in looking at that image, you, can, you don't have to think very hard to imagine in 1977 at the Chapel of the Cross what the implications would have been a couple of, what, days, essentially weeks after women were allowed to be ordained in our church, which was not easy, but extremely controversial, and church dividing when it happened, and to have Polly Murray in particular, and I'll say more about exactly who they were um, as the person that Peter led in that day. Um, what a great man and what a great historic moment. So we have put a spin on Independence Day this year by in the observance of it and the Sunday close to it um, by using the readings and preparing the service for Polly Murray, which is observed, Polly Murray's um, feast day is observed on July 1st, and of course Independence Day on July 4th as a, a federal holiday. So like Juneteenth, not a church holiday, but a federal holiday. And not all priests that die become, um, have an observance, just in case anyone's confused about that, right? Um, it is rare, and it's rare that you would know someone in your own lifetime that has an observance in this way. There is a lively discussion in our churches every year in church offices and probably in congregations about what it would mean to celebrate Independence Day at the altar of an Episcopal church. And it's usually a day when a lot of us are away, frankly. People are traveling and visiting friends and family, and people are here visiting friends and families. So we've done our best to try to make it a little bit interesting. So the questions about this day are usually about nationalism and national pride, and alongside that service, right, and um, sacrifice, and what it means to be an American, and its place in our faith. And there is worry that we pick nationalism over faith. Right, or that we confuse the two in America, not in all countries, but in the West often, but definitely in America. So the questions, I won't be settling them today, right? I won't solve them for you, but those are the, those are the dilemmas. So, and it's fair, that question is fair for us in the West to consider because we are Christians that live in the shadow of World War II, a genocide caused by, or defended by our faith, but also ended by our faith. Right? We live in the, the tension of that. And theologically, as Christians, we live in the tension of that. We live in that tension when we think about what it means to be Christians in the 21st century. Some would argue that all of our theology is, is based on the Holocaust, is after the Holocaust. The optimism we had in the West as Christians about who we could be shifted radically in the face of the Holocaust. And you can, I don't have to say much for you to understand where that would take it, right? Um, and we could argue that as Americans, the, the crisis that should cause us to wonder about who we are as Christians is slavery. Right? It, it didn't, um, but it should. So we live in the shadow of World War II and of our own American history, where profound injustices were defended and even established because of the church and through the church, the language of our faith, the same Bible that we read. 
So I think it's better to take that on seriously than to avoid it. So we are not pretending that it's not July 4th tomorrow, right? And as though um, this is just another Sunday in the season after Pentecost. So let me say the obvious. Faith is greater than nation. Our commitments and life in Christ are our first calling, defining of who we are, who our church will be, and what we seek to understand when we gather as we do today. We gather around this altar to be reminded of a future in Christ, an unfathomable equality and unity greater than the world has ever offered in any nation. We desire it more and more as we live our lives seeking unity with Christ. That is the point of communion, to be joined to the life of Christ, whatever that means. But you can hear how you could use that same language to defend almost any position. So it's important that we define what we mean. So we decided to use Polly Murray's readings and organize this service for her because in her person, the particularities of Polly Murray's life so particularly exemplifying the American aspiration, almost idealistically looking back, improbably, absolutely. We have learned many lessons since that life, but still admirably in seeing through the political frameworks of her time, through them to a holistic vision of who we that live in the United States should be and could be to one another. Now, Polly Murray was born in 1910 in Baltimore and died in 1985 in Philadelphia. Polly Murray was ordained an Episcopal priest in the first year that women could be ordained in the Episcopal Church, 1977, at the age of 66. After a long and distinguished career as a civil rights lawyer and legal theorist and author and poet, as you heard, documenting in their own biography, autobiography, more than once, and beginning in their 30s, which is quite audacious to document your own memoir, right? Also writing essays and poetry. So Polly carries on a robust correspondence with leaders of the Episcopal Church, civil rights organizations, even the Roosevelts when, they, when Franklin Roosevelt was in office, audaciously claiming their place as an equal in a world which would have made them outcast and marginal. It is quite something to read what Polly Murray writes and what is written about Polly Murray opening up for many of us the complexity of our histories, the simple versions we are told that give us a clear arc of progress or doom that tell some stories that call the names of famous military leaders, presidents or business leaders. And then there's the history of all the rest of us, which must have contained more than one like Polly Murray, that claim the fullness of themselves, not only the respectable or presentable or legally defined parts, and imagined a world in which all of that could be held and protected as it is in the love and delight of God. So in the church, we talk about freedom this time of year, and I think it's really important. It is a profound Christian value, complicated in this country where it is also the language of libertarianism and of armed militias. I get that part but I don't think we should let them have that word. The reading from Galatians that we have today, the book of Galatians, is probably the first literature that we have of the early church in the Bible, the earliest, written before the Gospels, a letter of Paul to one ethnic group within the Roman Empire, the Galatians, the Gauls, a despised and mocked people in their time. A legacy recorded, interestingly, in statuary. So, and I know some of you have been traveling. I've seen your postings in social media. So those of you that were in Berlin recently, or if you've been in Berlin before, and have seen the great Pergamon altar, right, or the art historians that have read about it, or you um, that do uh, classics have probably seen images of it. The Galatians are in it. It's a massive altar. It's to the Greek gods, massive, ancient, um, one of the, understood as one of the pillars of Western civilization. The Galatians, of all people, are in it, right? They're at the bottom. They're literally cast down. People are literally standing on them. All the language we use of being cast down or oppressed is in that imagery. You can see it in the stone. They are pressed down. They are defined as the marauding barbarians. They are defeated by the Greek gods, which later become the gods of Rome. So within the structures of how Europe is to live in classical civilization, there they are. 
and Paul speaks to them. Paul is writing to them. So to be very clear, there's no confusion about who Paul is writing to in a way that for us, the Galatians, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, whatever, right? It's very specific. Pick a neighborhood, pick a community, pick a town. It's like that. So like race and gender today, not just about what we can dream up in 2022, but framed in the mythos of our culture, permanent, God-given, destined. To these people, defined by the world around them, the very art and building blocks of the world around them, our friend Paul speaks today of their freedom. Hear it clearly, in no universe are they free. If they have ever been, or share a secret of their own belovedness or goodness with their children at night in a story, when they walk in the clear light of day, they see something else about who they are, the bad luck to be born as them, they must have thought, fate. To them, into that overwhelming sense of definition by the world, Paul writes, as you are in Christ, which means in our worldview, in our community, as we understand you, like a congregation, you are free and equal. It must have meant everything and absolutely nothing. You can become Jews and be free under our law, other teachers had told them. That's what all that language of circumcision is when you all get stuck reading a Paul letter up here. That's what's happening. Paul is saying, don't worry about that part. You are free as you are. Now, it's not actually a bad idea that he had the, the idea of becoming a Jew, becoming part of the community, and then becoming a follower of Christ. Not an evil idea, not a bad idea. Paul's just saying, not necessary. Even more, as you are, nothing about your body is unclean or wrong. Paul says, what I understand in Christ is that you are free. There is no distinction of person. So this reading is used for Polly Murray because Polly Murray struggled to understand their own gender in their time. You can hear it in how poorly I even exercise using the right pronoun to talk about Polly Murray. So the fact of that struggle is well documented. Polly's understanding, and Polly worked with physicians on this, is that they were male and in the wrong body. Polly sought help for that, even hospitalized themselves, had themselves hospitalized at times, and it was never resolved, so it's not clear how, how we should be addressing that. Um, and Polly had a longtime partner who was a woman, and even that is not, it's not clear exactly what all of that means. But more provocatively for our time, Polly identified as black and white, claiming the complete history of their mother's family from Durham, North Carolina. And I know North Carolina is well represented here this morning, right? Slaveholder and enslaved woman, and claiming the rights and responsibilities not granted to them under the law for Polly's self, denying no part of their own identity to fit into the legal categories of the time. I hope you can hear how radical that is. I don't care who you are. You are denying some part of who you are. I am too. All of us are because the world defines us. The lawyers know it better than the rest of us. We all do it, right? What a powerful thing to not do it. It is frankly as revolutionary as some of these letters of Paul. So in doing that, right, claiming the rights and responsibilities not granted to them under the law, denying neither identity to fit into the legal categories of the time, and still, of course, identified as black by the law, but insistent upon calling out that hypocrisy and calling our nation to reconcile that we are a multiracial people. Paul's, Polly Murray's story is far from mine and probably from most of us in many ways, and that is what is so compelling. The truth claims of a person whose life spanned most of the 20th century, who would have probably been a priest as a first vocation if that had been possible for their gender. Like the Apostle Paul, a teller of truths too great for the world to comprehend. Hear this, no slave no, nor free, no Jew nor Greek, no man nor woman. We are one in Christ Jesus, a truth we as Christians have never lived, ever in the history of our faith, except in small communities. Some write that this was the original creed, 
because we see it so often in the letters of Paul, maybe an early chant of that early community of followers of Jesus. Now, separatist Christians have tried, like the Amish, developing what they understand as a perfected society separate from secular government, and that is one way. The Baptists and the Evangelicals come from that strain of Christianity, building perfected communities of their own. Perfected, of course, defined on their terms, all of our terms, right, each one. Defining an internal logic and morality at times, like this time, trying to influence the government as well but usually understanding their faith to be its own separate idealistic space. Our nation to a degree is built upon that idea. Robust private practices, not supported by taxes with no one group having privilege over another. Now of course it is not played out that way, but that is what separation of church and state theoretically means. Often what it ends up meaning is that one kind of Christianity is reflected in our public life and at times subsidized by our taxes. But the rest of us must be very careful to steer clear of mentioning any issue that is hot in our current day's politics, the opposite of our brother Paul and of Polly Murray. As Anglicans, we are believers that our moral lives are structured and impacted, reflected by how the society we live in is organized and works. We are not separatists by heritage. And even in established Anglican nations like England, you will get in one generation of William Wilberforce arguing for the abolition of the slave trade, while other Anglicans, including bishops in government, argue against it, all from the same faith. The difference is that they expect their morality drawn from faith, as well as their economic interests and political or philosophical understanding of the world to impact how their government, their society is organized. On this Independence Day weekend, I am convicted by Polly Murray's moral imagination, and I hope we can all be infected with it. I'm sure I don't know what that would mean for you because Polly's brilliance was to take what was divided by the law and bring it together more truthfully as a whole. I encourage you to reflect upon that for yourself. What assumptions do you carry about what must not fit together, cannot, might be true for you or people you know, but seems to be rejected by the way things are? Where is that cornerstone just so out of sync that you cannot imagine the building that stands firmly upon that stone? And note that Polly Murray's revolutionary ideas are fairly ordinary, open-minded ones today, unfathomable in their time, which was in our lifetime. And on that amazing story from the Gospels, may I suggest that God is not like an absentee landlord. It does not say where God is in this story. The story reveals to you what you have been taught or what you assume that God is like. I believe the kingdom of God is like peace, the deep peace of right relationship, of justice and fairness for the laborer and the owner and the child and the lonely one, the harmed, the uncertain, the unlikely pairing, the invisible, the anxious, and the confident, the citizen, the Galatian, the easily offended, Ted Lasso, <laughs> the one who was afraid the law will not protect them from their neighbor, and the one who sleeps assured of their safety under the law. Wipe the dust off that cornerstone to read the message again. In Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ, free to seek the illimitable heights and depths of your being. For the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and is it not amazing in our eyes?